Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Life in Sport podcast. And we are joined by a very special guest. He is a current NRL referee, Ziggy Sheklasa Adamski. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, mate. Pretty good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've, it's going to be weird, but I've been working on it for like the last week. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of that. And I'm glad that I didn't butcher it. Um, first of all, how's your day been? Yeah, mate, pretty good. Um, day off, just went and got the car washed and uh, just doing some stuff around the house with the wife, keeping everyone happy. Yeah, nice, nice. And so let's get started on the um, the, the big questions, the questions that everyone wants to know. Question one is, do you follow any sports that aren't rugby league? And if so, which sports and teams? Yeah, mate, um, I do, definitely. Um, sports always been a massive part of my life. And uh, as a young, young Aussie kid, you know, we had... Um, great successful cricket sides league teams union even our soccer team was winning at the time so um two of my best mates in high school were soccer tragics as well as league tragics so i had to adopt a soccer team yep uh i landed on liverpool fc thanks to guys like harry kuehl great australian sportsman i follow uh, leeds united because of harry kuehl well there you go yeah and (laughs) i ended up at the time when you know just going with with harry Mm -hmm. he'd gone across liverpool yep just signed with them and they, they also had a Polish goalkeeper, um, Jezza yep. Dudek. And having that Polish background, I thought, well, all right, that's it, that's my team. And I yep. picked them, stuck with them, and um, yeah, stayed loyal over the years. And they're my, they're, my, they're my boys now, and that's how I get my fix. Um, I love a lot of sports, yep. um, but they're the that's where I get my fix from. And I can passionately sit there, cheer them on, ride the highs and lows, and you yeah. know, if they're winning championships like they are at the moment. Um, oh, how good the, was that that season, the season before COVID, when they just went? To demolish the whole competition mate but yeah they had a great year um and under Jurgen Klopp he's ever since he's come to the club as a manager he's just transformed them uh they yeah. had probably almost two decades of being there thereabouts or struggling um mm-hmm. there was a mixture of those results whether either mid-table or not quite reaching the heights they won a couple of champions or a champions league title and made another final and lost it but never were able to be consistent for a full season but ever since yeah. Klopp has come on board they've just been able to nail that and um yeah, I think a lot of Liverpool fans like myself are indebted to him and all the players that are there at the moment and the bond they've got. They're just going from strength to strength. And um, hopefully we re-sign Mo Salah. He's my favourite player. So if he leaves, oh, okay. I'll be devastated. So, oh, um, ho- hopefully. Hopefully he doesn't leave for your sake. Yeah. Um, at what age did you start uh, refereeing rugby league? Um, at 14, I started refereeing in the in the Parramatta district. Okay. Um, at the time, I was playing league and uh, there was a para official that came to our training session basically to try and recruit some referees and ask, he spoke about the, the benefits of it at the time. And, you know, as a 13 year old, not many of us probably listened to his full speech, but the one thing <laughs> yeah. we took out of it was you can spend an extra night a week together at training uh, and on the weekends in the mornings at that yep. time, we were playing obviously Saturday Arvo footy. Um, yep. Yep. And so for us, it was about hanging around my best mates um, at even more, even more. So it was just great yeah. um, to be able to do that. Yeah, so it was a sense of rugby league community, really, that um, drove you to do it. Because, as you said, you got an extra day to be involved with rugby league. Yeah, and just talk about whatever you want to talk about in, in your little inner circle. So it was yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, that kind of feeds in perfectly with the next question, which was, did you play rugby league or any other sports growing up as a kid? Which you mentioned rugby league. Um, you know, did, obviously you played rugby league. Did you play any other sports? Yeah, mate, I, I did. I had a pretty broad spectrum of sports. Um, my parents uh, got us started in Taekwondo as a little kid. Um, okay. So that was my first introduction. So I started at probably, I don't know, six or seven and kept up with that till I was 15, 16 and finished with a black belt. So that taught oh, us a lot kid. in terms of discipline and whatever. Um, but then, yeah, started with some tennis. Uh, I wanted to play league from a very young age. Being yeah. the oldest brother, my parents just said, nah, too dangerous, too risky. We'll let you play soccer first, being a yeah. European background with dad. They're like, we'll get you to play soccer. That's safe. You won't get injured. Well, my first <laughs> year playing soccer. Oh, no. Yeah, don't worry. Get the, we'll hear it. Uh, first year playing soccer, copped a mad slide tackle from behind and missed half the re- like, pretty much the rest of the season through that bad injury. Didn't, um, didn't cop an injury as bad when you played league? Oh, I had a few minor ones. I did oh, have okay. one that required a reconstructive surgery of my little finger, but the, the slide tackle was a bad one on the knee. Yeah. So, yeah um it was funny but yeah the parents from then said all right you can play league and then you know because i was the eldest brother my my younger brother could then do the same so probably the best thing that happened to me so that little kid out there that failed me big time in the under 11s and 12s at carlingford (laughs) thanks mate you uh, did me a massive solid uh (laughs) (laughs) no that's fair that's actually (laughs) that's awesome um and what was the deciding factor that you wanted to you know go for gold in the sense of 
try and make it at the top level as a referee in the NRL? Um, that didn't probably happen until a bit later in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, early on, you know, used to always, obviously every Friday night came out to my grandparents' place and um, watched Friday night footy. Yeah. Um, loved those promos. How, how good was that? Friday right. nights are great night for football. But right. um, what, yeah, exactly. Bring that back and uh, team right. and, and, and bring that, that that's my team one as well. Yeah, a few of the guys around the office love that one. It's either that, that's my team, or, or simply the best of Tina Turner. Simply They're the, the best, two. yep, absolutely. Um, they always get a run. But um, yeah, I guess um, when I was 18, uh, last year of high school, I had a really successful rugby union side that I played in. So mm-hmm. I had to balance up playing union at school, um, playing league on the weekends, repping league on the weekends. Plus, I was a bit of a bookworm and wanted to go to university. Mm-hmm. So I decided to stop playing league and to stay involved in league um i refereed kept mm-hmm. involved in refereeing um finished high school transitioned to uni and stopped playing union and really decided to give um refereeing an opportunity mm-hmm. uh was selected by uh les matthews at uh, you know rest his soul great um junior representative coach uh he asked me to come and trial with the junior rep squad mm-hmm. which are basically the group of officials that referee harold matthews sg ball yep. competitions in new south wales and from my, I remember from my first training session, walking in and seeing the guys around me, um, the grade squad, the setup of the quality of individuals that I'd seen officiating in first grade. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know what, I'm 18. Um, this is a, a real, there's a real chance here that if I stick at this and give it my all, there's an opportunity that may present itself down the track. And yeah, since then, that's kind of been the that was the that was the moment, um, yeah. and I guess coming from Parramatta and being around guys from the age of fourteen, like um, Alan Short or Gav Reynolds, Ashley Klein, Steve yeah. Ellison, guys that had been there, done it, watching Bill Harrigan yep. for a decade. Yeah, you know, you know, he did ten grand finals. I mean, that bloke, you know, he came through our district and association. He we did. have you know yeah. awards that are named after him. Exactly. Um, yeah, so it was real, real. Um, it was an achievable goal because I had those guys around me that I could yeah. see, talk to. Um, ask Learn questions. from, be a sponge from sort of thing. 100%. And that's, um, yeah, you've got to be coachable as a referee and, and as an athlete in general, you know, you, you look at all the best clubs, they've got systems in place that encourage that. And mm-hmm. um, the refereeing and officiating space is no different. Um, and at Para, we were spoiled. Um, yeah. You know, we had access, constant access to guys that would be giving back from the top. Um, and it was a real good culture. So it was a really easy transition and, career that I, I saw as an opportunity i never thought it would be possible so easy quickly um yeah, it is yeah. it did take a number of years but um it's amazing so but it's still like some some referees don't get their chance until like their mid to late 20s sort of thing sometimes even early 30s whereas as, as you were saying yours was somewhat like when i say someone i mean somewhat quicker sort of thing would you yeah say? i was pre- I was pretty fortunate to be around those guys from an earlier age. Yeah. You yeah. know, from, you know, the first training session or as a 15 year old at Parra, you were around those guys. So you wow. exactly what you're saying. You, you, you were kind of in a, without being in a representative squad, you had access to those individuals that had that experience that yeah. you wanted to, to pick up and lean on and, and ask questions of, and they could be like, you know, how do I handle this situation? I'm like, mate, I did that this way. This might work for you. Try this. They'll give you three or four different options off the bat yeah. just because they've had, they've been there and done that. Um, and that they're willing to give back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now touching about touching on some stuff about recent NRL stuff, like the last two, three years sort of stuff. Um, yeah. How have you adapted to the rule changes? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, look, as referees, it's something that we've always been taught. As little kids, you know, when you first start refereeing, you've got multiple layers of different law books for your, you know, your safe play code uh, into your international laws for the under 13s and above and then that continues on i mean i remember in around 2012 13 we were asked to you know we had two competitions you're refereeing in new south wales cup reserve grade competition at the time mm-hmm. that was had a set of laws given to us by the new south wales rugby league and then holden cup or toyota cup sorry yep. initially was known the under 20s comp that was run by the nrl so so that was, was a separate a, different rule book well yeah different interpretations across you know you'd make the same ruling but the restart would be completely different so and you'd find yourself refereeing on a friday night 20s saturday 3 p.m reserve grade and you've got to apply two sets of laws that are different conflicting um same you know still a simple decision but you've got to remember the restart you know so that that kind of stuff um 
has been around rugby league for a long time and always will be. Um, yeah, you know, society's changing, yep. things are changing, the world's changing. Um, yep. So the game's got to move with those times. Uh, in yep. terms of uh, training, what our coaches and um, S and C staff deliver, um, we do what's called like a lot of brain training under fatigue. So mm-hmm. B tough sessions. So they basically get us working in short bursts at a really high intensity. Yep. Um, and whilst we're in that state of fatigue, they'll then you know, throw us some questions, it'll be their rule-based scenarios, or they'll be giving us whilst we're under that high intensity work rate exercise, either on a rower or on a salt bike yep. or a grinder, they'll be giving us um, information to retain that's specific to an NRL match. Yep. Um, then at the end of that set, that way it's quite- like you that's why it's that way it's simulating more or less like they're asking you, but basically like they're simulating a, the 60 minute mark of a game where you're gassed, more or less, sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're under your, they work us to a higher heart rate than we get to in a game yep. so that it's beyond, you know, what we, beyond exertion levels of what we'd reach out there on an NRL fixture. Mm-hmm. And then they, you know, ask you for questions or memory retention or anything that's going to test you and you, you're under fatigue already. So it's basically training you to be able to deliver in a calm, competent manner. Um, yeah. And we do that all the time. So yeah, there's, there's that side. There's also MAZ sets. Um, so out on the running paddock, um, they'll have us, you know, do like a, a drill. A MAZ set's just 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off. And in mm-hmm. that 15 seconds off, you'll be doing like an active running recovery. Yep. Um, but the 15 seconds on, we'll, we'll have like six different work so- type of efforts that we'll do. Like one might be a 70 meter straight line run. Yep. Two might be a 35 meter shuttle. Um, and then the other four movements are also completely different and specific yep. to the roles that we carried out on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And they work us to, for, you know, four, three, four, five minute period. Um, and during that time, each 30 seconds, I'll call out just the number as your starting point and you've got to, you know, retain whilst what, you're yeah. fatigued, what your, your next action is physically. Yeah, Cause it won't go one, two, three, four. It could go three, one, four sort of hundred percent yeah and we call that that's our unpredictable mad sets yep. um and there'll be elements of that too where we as a group of um officials will also have to communicate amongst each other as a key part of that session so it's building in and incorporating a lot of aspects of our training into a simple four or five minute conditioning set that we do you know once a week but it's just reiterating the fact that you've got to be ready um, yep. whether you're on the training paddock or out in the first grade field you're, you're delivering quality you know what yep. i mean Absolutely. No, absolutely. And like, that's a, a really good insight. So thank you very much for that. Um, how did you as a professional referee handle the unprecedented COVID lockdown in 2020? Um, look, mate, that was, that was a really tough one. Um, it, COVID was hard for everyone. It, it hit everybody differently. Personally, I struggled. Yeah. Um, I love routine. Um, we went from starting a season at the end of a really sharp preseason. So I was in really good sh- I remember I was in really good shape or good nick yep. at the end of that preseason. We started rounds one and two. Um, I, I remember I refereed both games with Henry Perinara as his pocket ref. Yep. Um, and then it was zero. Um, and it was a massive shock to the system. Like people always say, you never really appreciate uh, what you have until it's taken away from you. Well, for the first time in my life, um, something that I love, um, I've worked so hard for, I've dedicated so many aspects of my life toward it was just taken away from us. Yeah. Um, and then you had the magnitude of it. Like the English Premier League was had stopped. The NBA had stopped. The, the Olympics NBL. had stopped. Yeah. You know, all these world sports that were bigger than rugby league yeah. stopped. Yeah. So the reality starts to, to hit and you're like, well, if these codes are stopping, what are the chances of our game picking back up again? Like the EPL, yeah. you know, one one club in, the, in England is, is worth more than the entire NRL competition. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's yeah. the magnitude of that's like, okay, if they can't find a way to resume, how are we? Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, you know, you just start looking to the people around you and you just got to start over really. Um, so it was great for us as a sport when we had obviously Peter Volandis, uh, Andrew Abdo, Anna's League had the commission. They all got together and we were one of the first sports around the world that got back together yeah. with half the resources when you compare us to them. So absolutely, kudos to the, that group of people because without them, we wouldn't have had a sport. To oh, absolutely. Be part massive, of. massive um, ups to them for doing mm. that. Yeah. It's, absolutely. It, it's, yeah, it's incredible. Um, and during that 10 week NRL break in 2020, during the COVID break, what was your Netflix binge or Stan binge or whatever show 
or movie did you end up you know just watching the entirety of yeah mate um wife and i so we bounce around a fair few things so mm -hmm. the witcher she loves henry cavill so the witcher yeah. got a good got a good start um and i got into that with her um the last dance with mj was going around at the time yeah, watch that i remember that yeah i think most people in sport would have watched that <laughs> once twice three times yep um the crown about the royal family yeah, that, massive royalist, my, mom, so. my mom got into that so yeah she loved that yeah did you watch uh, tiger king no i didn't no? a few boys did but uh no i wasn't one of them unfortunately okay. so I missed that. did you obviously i did and it's so season two dropped last year and it's so good like it, i mean it's not good like it's absolutely trash but it, it's yeah. so good it's so trashy it's good yeah you know? that's what makes these things great isn't yeah, it I mean, squid game was another one that i ended up binging binging last year it was after the nrl season had finished so did you and have you watched squid, uh, english have you watched squid game yet no i haven't my no. wife has watched a bit of it and mm -hmm. um i think that's the next one on the hit list so absolutely what else did you binge or was that about it uh no shit's creek for a bit of comedy and relief but that yeah. was quite funny um yeah. i yeah. haven't seen that yet but i've but i've been it's on my to watch list yeah talk about trashy comedies it, it's yeah. up there but it's got some real good um yeah it's just interesting oh, i don't yeah. want to ruin anything for okay. you but it's, it's worth a watch it's got some good lols in there and um, okay yeah it's quite entertaining uh-huh uh, besides that mate the wife and i started a veggie garden um, oh, nice. yeah she used to be a florist and yeah it was just something, something creative new. and rewarding and whatever at the end of it you get some veggies out of it but it's just hey, something you know occupied keep me busy keep me away from her give her some time and space you know during the covid lockdown it was more yeah. about keeping her yeah, sane sometimes exactly. so myself. you both didn't get cabin fever sort of thing yeah 100 percent. get outside work in the outdoors now nah, that's it um I'm just reading through the, the list of questions. Uh, yeah. duh, duh, duh. And how do you personally prepare for a game? Like, is there a set routine? Because you said you you like you said you do like routine. Is there a certain yeah. way you have to put on your socks in the morning of a, of a game day sort of thing? Uh, no, not not particularly in terms. Of, I mean, yes, I am a man of routine, absolutely. Uh, in terms of preparing for a game, um, we get our appointments on you know on today on a Tuesday. Um, so the prep time for us will vary depending on where we're officiating and when we're traveling yeah. etc so if you've got a tuesday or thursday it's really short turnaround yeah, yeah um on a tuesday all i like to do is um read through the team lists and make sure i've got a good grasp of the names um yeah, yeah. like you were laughing about pronouncing my name well, it's the yeah. same for us with players so yeah when we get to the ground if we're unsure during the warm-up we'll go and speak to that player yeah um and make sure that we're pronouncing his name correctly or yeah. you know if he wants to be called junior or tavita yeah. in terms of yeah so just little things um because yeah. they, they do matter absolutely um yeah and then i'll watch a fair personally I'll, i like to watch a fair bit of video on each team just mm -hmm. so i can pick up trends or, or traits of how they like to play structures um that way you can sort of help engage the flow of the game sort of thing yeah it's more for things like so when we had the two ref system um if whenever you're appointed to a team you, you'd watch how they, they they have their structured shape and attack so for instance melbourne storm um when they had billy slater and i was in the pocket for them it, i was appointed to referee a game where they were involved i'd watch a fair bit of footage around how Billy moved and swept because he he was a fullback that obviously his whole game was based a lot of Melbourne's attack was based around him as the linchpin so you didn't want to at any point get in his way and because yeah. he had such great feet um yeah, yeah it was just you'd, you'd have to watch video so that when we came into the pocket delivered our comms and then retreated we weren't getting in the way on our retreat run of him sweeping across gotcha. um, yeah because yeah. often you, you could ruin a play for a side if you held him up just for a meter and then you know he'd he, you'd see him deliver those comms to other referees, you know, when they got in his way. So I just didn't want to be one of those guys. Um, yeah, that's fair. And it can happen. I mean, he's a freak. Yeah. I remember guys, people were writing him off after, before he came back from his last injury. Yep. And he came back and he was bigger and better than ever. Right, he was um, faster. Like, how does that happen? He, but it does. He seriously was. Mm. I, I remember, yeah, exactly what you just said. That 2019 season, um, he was electric. Yeah. And yeah, I couldn't believe. Anyway, whatever. It was insane. People were writing him off and you just look at him. <laughs> We had the best seat in the house as that assist referee you're, you're really you're within half a meter bumping shoulders with them on the field and you get to see it up you know up close live and breathe it and you got the best seat in the house so you got to make sure that you're not getting in his road to yeah. put simply but you're also in a position to make your decisions because those de those decisions um are crucial yeah absolutely absolutely um <laughs> Hard. Um, and how do you handle any criticisms that come your way or the general like or to like, ugh, brain finding hub sorry how do you yeah. handle any criticisms that come your way 
or the general referee's way when on the field or post game? Yeah, on the field, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, during the run of play, it's always background noise to us. Um, just like players talk about, you know, a, fr- a frosty reception yep. for them at away games. Um, it's very rare that for us, if the home team is behind at halftime or full time, that when we're walking off the field, we're not receiving that same frosty reception. Yeah. Um, it's part of the theatre of sport, really. So, yeah. you know, I understand when I'm sitting in front of the telly watching Liverpool play, if the ref makes a 50-50 <laughs> call goes against, you know, it's the same yeah. thing. Like we all, we all use sport as an escape. I think. Um, and, and that's something that's become more relevant and to so many people with what's going on around the world now and here in Australia with the, you know, we've had the devastating floods of yep. late, you got COVID situation, everything going on over in Ukraine, it, sports an escape for so many people is, and yeah. Australians we've lent on sport for decades, you know, be it cricket with the great teams that we've had in the past union when we were winning everything in the nineties. Yeah. So anyway, but um, I digress, let's get back no, to it. Um, Criticism post game is different for me. Um, yeah. On field, field, it's easy. Criticism post game, you, I've found that I'll lean on those that have helped me get me to this point now. Mm-hmm. Um, so be they coaches or other referees that have been there and done it. When it comes to the technical aspects of refereeing, um, we're really blessed with our officiating within our officiating department. So yeah. we've got experienced coaches that have been there and done it. So I'll go and have a conversation with them if I feel something's on my mind or getting to me or whatever. Uh, Generally it's water off a duck's back, but sometimes, you know, there'll be a valid criticism and you need to know how to, how to work with that. Um, We've also, you know, Matt Checkin who retired last year, he's spoken openly around the challenges of of what can transpire in our, in our role, Yep. Um, you know, with, with death threats, et cetera. Um, And if you bottle it up, you know, we're only human. It's got massive negatives. Um, yeah, you might be able to carry a physical injury through a game, but if you go out onto an NRL pitch and you're carrying some form of mental burden, you, you've you got to be at your peak mm. to be able to make one decision, let alone, you know, the couple of hundred that we have to make during a game. So you want to go out there with a clear head and in a relaxed yep. manner. So, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, if, if, if you've got something going on, um, you know, don't, it's not weak to speak. You know, there's a slogan yeah. out there, but seriously, yeah. uh, for us on field with the criticism that comes after, if, if you've got issues, speak to someone. Um, you know, you've all got family members or people you trust. And if, if that's not enough, you know, reach out beyond your inner circle and see a sports psychologist, see a shrink, see, you know, see a professional that can help you because it's it's only it's gonna make you a better official and person, really. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, um, how did it feel? And what did it mean to you personally to be awarded the Russell Smith Medal in 2018? Uh, well, yeah, mate, that was a that was a big one at the time. That's kind of our Rookie of the Year, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it's yeah, Russ, Russ and I have got a really tight relationship. Um, he's been a, a, a real key figure in my coaching career. Um, personally, I've always gone to him. Um, so to win a medal that was named after him meant a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, it meant one I had a foot in that I was an established figure in, in our squad, but, or I was establishing myself as a figure in the squad, rather, I should say. But it was just recognition from coaching staff, peers, that what you're doing is down, you're going along the right path. Yeah. And if you continue, yeah, you can have continued success. But Russell, for me personally, um, as a technical referee, he's been my main man, my mentor. So, um yeah i got a bit tear, teared up when um yeah my name was read out that presentation i remember exactly where it was um yep. yeah at p1 there in, in the city and near uh sydney harbour it was outstanding um yeah it meant, meant a lot and he yep. means a lot to me now and if i've you know he's actually still one of my coaches at the moment and i'll call and have a chat to him on the weekly about yep. certain things be it rugby league or just life in general and yeah it was a meant a lot mate yeah, nice. Um, just got a few more questions left for you. Uh, next, like the first of three last ones is right. talk me through a game day for Ziggy, you know, from when you wake up till the final siren goes on game day. Yeah, like we've touched on, I'm definitely a man of routine. So um, while I'm at home, I'll have my, um, if I'm at home, I'll have my uh, game day brekkie. Uh, yeah, what's that? The whole... Is it a specific meal? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, the, the, the family all joke around it. And everyone in the family now refers to it as a, as a game day brekkie. You know, the, the in-laws have adopted it too. Um, anyway, but yeah, um, it's, yeah. Well, if you're asking, yeah. So smoked salmon, uh, some poached eggs and just toast, mate. It's pretty simple. It's nothing too yeah, fancy. So yep. yeah, but anyway, whatever. Um, and then after just a nice brekkie and coffee, 
just spend some time in front of the telly doing some mobility and stretching. Uh, if, if I can sneak in an afternoon nap, brilliant. If not, whatever. Um, and then on the trip to the games, just listening to some music, some chilled out 70s and 80s. You know, okay. but, yeah. Um, yeah, after that, um, if I can have a chat with someone, brilliant. Like my brother, best mate, wife or parents. Um, that's pretty much the essence just stay relaxed talk to people that uh, have always been around and um i trust you know um yeah nice. yeah then when, when when we get to the ground all sorts of things happen like you've just got to walk in drop off your comms kit for the technicians and if there's a game on prior i'll have to sit there and just watch that for a bit just to relax and chill out um mm -hmm. yeah i mean the game day routine you pretty much rock up drop off your kit get ready about 30 to 40 minutes prior to kick off we all go out as a, as a squad for the day to warm up and yep. then we come back in five minutes before kickoff. And yeah, the only other routine I think boys would say I have is I, I like to get a picture of the crew before we, just before we go out, you know, yeah. on field kit, just get a quick pick, um, something to remember the career after I'm, you know, yeah, I was gonna say, about I, and retired. When I was searching you online and all that, you know, to find out as much as I could, there was quite a few of you with the, whether it's your Atachi or whether it's your, uh, a lead referee, but I noticed that there's you and two others. So it's obviously you and touchies or you as a touchy and the others, like, as you said, a crew pick, which I think is a, is a nice sentiment for yourself. Yeah. Well, at the, at the end of the day, you know, it's all going to come to an end at some point. Uh, you never know when that's going to be. And for me personally, it's about remembering the moments that you, you get to share with your, your teammates. And for us, yeah, we're not going out there and winning competitions and grand finals as because we're not playing, we're refereeing and officiating, but yeah, it's about facilitating a game and, and staying out of it as much as you can. Um, but along the way, you're going to form some great friendships and we're going to form great, take away some great memories too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've got two last questions for you. Second, first one being, if you could referee alongside any former referee, at the NRL level, who would it be and why? Yeah, so because it's a former ref, I can't say Ben Cummins, but the boys around the office would say Ben Cummins for sure, just because he's my man crush at work and we've got, <laughs> we've got a bit of a reputation that way. Um, but former referees, uh, it'd have to be Bill Harrigan. Yes. Um, yeah. Just because coming through the ranks as a Parramatta referee, uh, he was he refereed everything. He had all the records. Um, a really well-respected individual yeah. um, in the game. Oh, yeah. um, I had the privilege of interviewing him last year. It was amazing. So I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And I've, I've read his autobiography and his career, you know, in the rock, you know, public order riot squad. Um, you know, the, the guys had a really interesting life. Um, yeah. And yeah, he, he just had the respect of the players. I think as an assist ref in the two ref system, I mean, Bill only refereed in the one ref, so you'd, you'd have to be his touch judge, but that'd be the same anyway. But as, as an assist ref, I got to see, you know, how the likes of um, Ash Klein, Ben Cummins, Jerry Sutton, Matt Check, and guys that have refereed over 300 games, how they interacted with players, what worked for these guys. And yep. you, you try and adopt their skill set, and you're not going to be the same because they've, no. we've all got different mannerisms and um, characteristics and traits. So you're not going to be that person, but you get to see what works for those individuals. And I'd be lying if that I, I don't try and adapt different traits from each of these people. So I'd love to be a fly on the wall, you know, and, and be around Billy when he was refereeing and how yeah. he handled interactions with players. Um, you know, everyone's seen the... He had a no-nonsense yeah. sort, of, no. sort of thing with no. it. And no, he didn't. But you, you know, I've, I've bumped into Gordon Tallis um, oh. in recent years. <laughs> yep. And you know what? Gordy speaks really highly of Bill. He does. And, yep. yeah, he sent and... off Michael Butner twice. Sorry, not sent off. Sin bin him twice in one game. And same with Michael Butner. I've, I've spoken with him. And even he has Bill Harrigan in very high regard. Yeah. And, and so that's where I think it was just Bill was obviously no nonsense. And but he was genuine. And yeah. I think that's maybe why he had that respect. I mean, I've never asked him that question, but I think, you know, yeah, listening to different players speak about him um, post their careers. Yeah. I think that that's the, the takeout possibly, you know, or I can assume without knowing. Yeah. No, that's fair. Um, yeah. And last question is what advice would you give to any youngsters who are thinking about, you know, becoming referees or, you know, anyone who's wanting to maybe make it big, not make it big, but, you know, try and crack the NRL uh, as a referee? Yeah, good question. Um, I think for me personally, um, for me, the answer to this question is enjoyment, but um, remember why you're refereeing. So, yeah, if you enjoy what you do, it's going to assist you in those pressure moments to be relaxed. Um, so, yeah, make sure you know why you're doing what you're doing. So if you want to be a referee, you want to be a touch judge, 
make sure you know why. So that if, when things get tough, you can just ask yourself that question and, and weigh up if it's all worth it because it's not all highs where you're going to be appreciating the, the best game of the round. There's a lot of lows and you need to be mentally prepared to, to grit your teeth, bear it and go through that. Um, give yourself every opportunity. Um, so by that, I mean, listen to the coaches, listen to people, stay in shape um, physically. But you, you spoke earlier about you know, being a sponge. It, it's a lot of refereeing and officiating is, is that exactly. Um, much easier to learn from somebody else's mistakes than your own. Yeah. I mean, that's part and parcel of, of everything in life, really. Um, so, yeah, understand that every coach is just going to, they're not going to waste time by coming out to watch you officiate and give you advice that isn't well-intentioned. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, make sure you're listening and don't be afraid to seek out a mentor. Um, yeah, I know it might seem daunting to people, but, it, you know, I was fortunate enough. There was a, a scholarship that the rugby league um, ran in conjunction with the Australian Institute of Sport. And in 2013, I got partnered up with Matthew Checkin. And um, as a mentor, he taught me things that, you know, you, you think you know it all, obviously, as, as a young kid coming, you know, whatever. You, 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 people think that they know everything until you, you meet someone that knows a lot more um, yeah. people, you know, you know being, meeting and seeking out a mentor was one of the best things that can happen and yeah, never give up and just keep it simple. Yeah. Nice. Um, honestly, that's awesome. And thank you very much for your time today. Um, hopefully the rest of the season goes well for you and, you know, injury free and all that sort of stuff for you. And hopefully we can get you on again sometime, either at the end of the season or next season, something like that. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope anyone who's listened to this, when this episode goes up, um, enjoyed the chat with Ziggy Sheklasa Adamski.